thankful for the Lord for his blessings on our life and uh, thanks for the opportunity just to come into your homes again and to uh, share the gospel of Jesus Christ with you. I pray that uh, you'll be attentive and uh, sing along with us while you're there in your living room, especially if you're there by yourself. Nobody will care how good or how bad you are. They'll just be glad you're singing. So, uh, but uh, if you would, bow your heads with us. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we love you this morning. We're grateful for the peace that you give us, the joy you give us. And Father, thank you most of all for your mercy and forgiveness for serving the Lord. It seems like on a daily basis we need that. And I ask you, Father, in Jesus' name, Lord, just to breathe on this service, that you touch the lives, Father, of all those that may view us, either by Facebook or YouTube or by any other means they may use. I thank you, dear Lord, for this privilege to be able to come into their homes. I ask you, Father, today to touch uh, Orville Johnson's family. Father, he uh, has come home to be with you. And, uh, Lord, I thank you, dear Father, that uh, his life, Father, Magnify the Lord Jesus, and Father, today he's with you in that beautiful city that you went to prepare for all of us. I pray, Father, for others, dear Lord, that may be hurting, those that may be going through some type of sickness. I pray that you minister to their needs, be with our shut-ins, those, Lord, that are unable even to get out of their homes. I pray that you touch and bless them as well. I pray your blessing, Father, on the offering that's given here, dear Lord, every week. Dear Lord, thank you for those that have been faithful to help us, dear Lord, to do the work of the kingdom. I pray you bless our songs, let the message your word challenge and change our hearts, and we'll praise you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Can I get an amen out there? Amen. All right, that was a weak one, but I'll take it. Amen. What a mighty God we serve. If you know it, sing it with us. All right. You ready? What a mighty God we serve. persecution or whatever, uh, as he was with those that uh, lived long before us, uh, he's also going to be with us. He said that, I'll never leave you, I'll never forsake you, I'll be with you uh, in the sixth trouble. He didn't say in the sixth blessing. He said in the sixth trouble, and I'll not forsake you in the seventh. So, trouble's going to come, 
of all different sides. But I'm grateful that we have a great Savior that lives inside our hearts every day and helps us along life's pathway. I woke up uh, singing this song uh, this morning, so it's an old hymn. It says, Fill My Way With Love. If you know it, uh, it's, in, it's in the songbook if you want to open up one of the songbooks. But uh, it's called Fill My Way With Love. Sing it with me if you can, all right? Let me walk, blessed Lord, in the way thou hast gone, leading straight to the land above, giving cheer everywhere to the sad and the lone. Fill my way every day with love. Fill my Terry Clark started doing his music back in the 70s, I think. 
And uh, he was one of those guys that was so lost and so undone that he lived out in the woods naked. I mean, if you ever read his testimony, you'd go, wow, what a change God made in this guy's life. But he met the Lord Jesus Christ, and he was kind of like the guy, the maniac Gadara that lived in the tombs and was cutting himself and was walking around naked all the time, and he was just a mess. But he met the master, and the master changed his life. Oh. And some of the songs that Terry wrote, in fact, we're going to do a couple of them uh, this morning, uh, just lets us know the relationship, basically, that he had with our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And if you can talk about having a relationship, then you have to ask yourself, how deep is that relationship? And I think in the day and time in which we're living right now, we need to go deeper than we ever have in our relationship with our Lord and Savior. So my prayer to God is that you'll just sing this with us and say, yeah, God, you are so good to me. I wouldn't know how to live if I didn't have you in my life. God, you're so good to me. You've always been so good.
What I was going to say about that is I cried a lot, and so now I can't see. <laughs> My eyes are burning, and uh, the glasses. I don't know. On his desk. Probably my glasses around my desk, but I don't think it makes a difference. I mean, after you've cried and you've prayed and you've sought the Lord. Uh, you know, I always go home on Sundays uh, wore out, but I go get wore out because being in God's presence will do that. His power and His presence on your life many times will cause the tiredness of our flesh. But our spirit, man, gets quickened, and we've been made alive Amen. in the blood of Jesus Christ. He has washed us and cleansed us. My wife's bringing me my glasses, so. She goes, because I'm not getting hers. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Thank you, honey. Hi, Lois. <laughs> Did you see her, Lois? You got to look at her. So. And I don't know why she came out here for me to see her. But, uh, you know, this song, I, I've sang it by myself many times, and, and I was going over with Linda this morning. And uh, God invites us, each and every one of us, into the throne room. There was a time, you know, back under old covenant law, that you could not enter into the most holy place. But the Bible said when Jesus died on Calvary's cross, it said the veil of the temple, which was that tabernacle that was erected by Moses, the veil in that temple, which was probably six inches thick, according to what some uh, people tell us, that it would took 12 yoke of oxen to tear it apart. Um, God, as Jesus said, it is finished. It said the veil of the temple was rent in twain from top to bottom. And God, what he was saying to all of us is, now you all can come in. He calls us kings and priests unto our God. So we have access to be able to go into the throne room of God. So don't think for one moment you've got to have a preacher pray for you for you to get into the presence of God. You don't. You can get in his presence all by yourself. Amen. And depending on how hungry you are for his presence, you may dwell around in the outer court for a while when the sacrifices were made and blood was flying and all the things were being burned up in that sacrifice. Or maybe you could even come to the place in your life where that you enter into the holy place where there was a candlestick that was burning you have that infilling of the Holy Spirit that's shining over on the bread, which was a picture of the Word of God, and then that altar of incense that was offering up prayers to God. You may be able to come in there, and there's a joy to full time just being there. But there's also a place that we can go to God where the He literally takes over. In other words, I've been in that room from time to time, and my always my words that come out of my mouth are, Lord, I, I don't know what to say. I don't know what to pray. Thank God for the infilling of the Holy Spirit. Sometimes the Lord allows me to pray in tongues to the point that I don't always know what's coming out of my mouth, but I do know that I'm in God's presence. And when he takes over, you'll find that your whole being will be refreshed. You'll be made new again. And I don't care what anybody says. Sometimes we need to be rejuvenated. Would you agree with that? There's certain times in our lives I've been down, I've been going through this or that, and I needed that refreshing. Amen. And I've had those times when the water was pure and clean, and when I was drinking of it, it was refreshing the very most inner part of my being. And if you've never experienced that in your life, I implore you, I would plead with you, Get on your face before God and say, Lord, let me enter into that place where that I'm not just talking to you, but you're talking back. Amen. Because God will speak to us in our innermost being. Amen. And that's what this song's about. It's the throne of grace that allows us to come in to his presence. So you, I know you don't know it, but listen to the words of it. All right. There is a special place. The most beautiful place I have ever seen. There's a throne room surrounded by angels singing, singing hallelujah to the King of Kings. I invite you to the throne room. 
and the king himself has bid you come in this room Praise the Lord. You know, we're uh, in a very volatile time in our nation right now, and you wonder what's coming down the road. Uh, persecution is probably looming, especially for the church, in such a measure that maybe we've never known. We've, we've read about persecution in other countries. I've actually been in lands where that you've seen the persecution of churches and the way that the country would rape and take away uh, everything that folks hold, held dear for so so long and we've been holding on to ours for a long time would you say amen to that yeah. we've had more of god's blessings than uh, most any other nation that i've ever known of and it seems like as the years have passed uh, even from back in the 70s when things began to just kind of go in a different direction and when all of a sudden we were making laws to be able to to commit sin because basically that's what it was murder is sin and we make laws to you know uh, sanction it and say that it's okay and even celebrate it to the point of lighting up buildings and stuff and saying oh we are now free well the only freedom that we're ever going to know is the freedom that we have in Jesus Christ there's not, it's not the freedom of America, and it wasn't a political party that we should have been looking to, but we should have been looking in the whole time to God. I think sometimes our confidence in men sometimes outweighs our confidence in God. And 
You know, I've learned even through this horrible pandemic and through all the things that's going on right now that because of our sin, because of killing so many of our babies and allowing so much sin to just run rampant in our land and really, really, I mean, I don't want to be critical, but really not standing up against it as a church and have learned, it seemed like, to became saying years ago, we've got used to the dark. Would you say yes to that? Things that are around us that at one time we would have went, oh my Lord, would get embarrassed by. Now we look at and gawk at and act as though it's nothing wrong. Uh, I, I've been burdened and my, my life was attacked this week in a way that uh, it hadn't been in quite some time. And uh, it's just my own flesh, my own desires and passions that rise up from time to time. And I was reminded that I can't do this by myself. There's not a person that can do this. Uh, you can put anybody you want to in public office. They're not going to fix the ills of mankind. They can't. They don't have the wisdom. They don't have the knowledge. They don't have the strength. The only person that can fix things is Jesus Christ. And what we need to do, and I don't mean to preach to you, but what we need to do is fix us before we try to fix anybody else. I think sometimes we're pointing fingers and saying, you know, that guy needs to change and that guy needs to fix this and that guy. When's the next time, you know, maybe the next time maybe we ought to just turn our fingers over and say, God, fix me. Make me a holy vessel. Make me a clean individual. Let me be the light that you said I was. Because that's what Jesus said. He said, when I was here, you said I was the light. He said, but I'm going away. He said, now you are the light. Tim and I were talking about it earlier today. Because, uh, you know, I tell them, I say, you know, there's people that you work with every day. They look at your Christian life. They, and they look at the walk that you have. But mostly they're not looking at you to see how good you are. They're looking at you to see if you make a mistake. And you make one, and they'll ride that thing. I like, told him, I said, it'll be like fleas on a dog. They'll jump on you and tell you, see, I told you you weren't all that you said you should be. Well, you know what? Just like that bumper sticker that you talked about. Christians aren't perfect. We're just forgiven. And we need to learn if we do stumble and fall, even in front of our lost family members or people that we are in contact with on a daily basis, we need to learn to say, I'm sorry. I didn't mean for that to come out of my mouth. I didn't mean to act that way because I know that I'm supposed to be a light for Jesus Christ. He didn't set us up to be judges. He set us up to be lights. And I'm grateful that he is living in my heart and in my life. And I know that if I'm a light at all, it's going to have to be uh, in the marketplace. We can all shine in each other's faces here. Put a flashlight on one other's face. Okay, and we're all the bright lights of Jesus. Where you're really shining. You've seen our sign when you go out the door. You are now entering your mission field. That's where we shine, is out there. But I've learned this. And this song kind of testifies to the fact that, that God is in control. If you started a journey down alone and if your heart's been searching for a place to call home, and it's in an affliction has led you.
If dark clouds should arise and thunder roll, just look to the master. Praise the Lord.
It is good to be in the house of the Lord. Amen? It's good just to, when I say the house of the Lord, those of you that are joining us um, this morning, there's, we have some here in the congregation, and we have some that are joining us on Facebook, and, uh, you know, whether you're in this building or whether you're at home or wherever you may be watching us, uh, the Bible says, know you not that you are the temple right. of the Holy Ghost, that God dwells within you. So if you're joining us today, you know, you're in the house of the Lord. Amen. You don't have to be physically at Woodhaven Worship Center. If you're joining us, you're in the house of the Lord, and we're glad you're here with us. We uh, just, you know, um, ex just been feeling this presence as Pastor Ron said I was here myself early and got to spend some time with the Lord in prayer and uh, you know it's uh, it's an interesting thing that the day and time that we're living in right now um, so much going on all around us and uh, so many are feeling the effects of uh, what's taking place uh, if you're not um, I'm sorry but it's kind of like how can you not see what's going on It'd almost be like an ostrich sticking his head in the sand. Um, we can't be uh, ignorant of that. And yet, um, as Pastor Ron was just singing in that song, you know, be not weary, do not uh, grow weary, um, that the Holy Spirit is here in this place. And uh, I felt I felt the Lord say to me this morning, and I, I want to get into the word here, but I felt the Lord saying to me this morning, and I feel, you know, I don't know about you, however, and whatever you think about that, but I believe the Holy Spirit speaks to us. I believe he talks into our hearts and he uses a lot of different things and ways to speak to us. And as I was praying this morning and I was just kind of quiet for a little while, I heard the Holy Spirit just say to me so strong, Chris, I'm going to give you grace in that place. I'm going to give you, I know that might sound like a rhyme, but I was praying about something and I had stopped praying about it. And I just heard the Holy Spirit just say so strong, Chris, I'm giving you grace in that place. And uh, I just said, thank you, God. Thank you, Lord. Yeah. Thank you, amen. I, I hold on to that, amen. But, you know, I, I'm looking here and, uh, you know, I, whenever God has me uh, share something, I really feel that most of the time when I share it, it's, uh, it's, it's applicable to me as well as to everyone else, but I really feel like God puts me inside of the story. When you read the Bible, I pray that you would do that. I, I pray you'd find things in there that God may be trying to pertain to you as an individual, uh, maybe as your, for your family, maybe as a nation. So as preachers, especially, you know, we try to do that and hear God in that uh, story or in whatever he may be speaking to us. And this week I was reading the book of Ruth. I've been just kind of going through my Bible, reading through my Bible. And I got to the book of Ruth and I started reading in the book of Ruth and the Holy Spirit started speaking some things to me. And as I was um, feeling like the Lord was wanting me to start sharing maybe this morning out of this story. And I, I, I was praying about it and I said, Lord, I, I don't think I've ever really preached from the, the book of Ruth. I, I might have shared some stories about it. But when you look at the book of Ruth, and I was, as I was giving it, and I want to just uh, implore you to, today, um, if you get a chance, you know, to look at the book of Ruth, um, it's only four short chapters, so really not that long. But man, is it loaded with good stuff. I mean, there's so much stuff in the book of Ruth. You know, and, and the book of Ruth, there's only, and, you know, it's amazing, out of all the books of the Bible, there's only two books in the Bible that are named after women. One is Esther, and the other one is Ruth. And so that in itself says there's something very significant about it. But when you read it, it's not just an allegory. It's a very uh, prophetic book. And it's also a book that relates to, uh, I think, e e back then, but I think there's a spiritual uh, thing that we can look at and say, God, we can apply this today to today in this day and time that we are living in. And so as I was looking at this and praying about it, and as I'm, I'm feeling God, you know, how he starts building things in you and starts speaking to you, immediately when I first started looking at it, God started speaking to my heart. And so I'm going to kind of go back and forth. Um, I'm not going to read every, you know, every chapter. I mean, even though it's short, that would take a long time to do. But I'm going to kind of glean from each one and probably spend most of my time in chapter one. Uh, with God helping me. So, Father, I just pray right now that as we gather here today, 
Lord, and we feel your spirit. We feel your presence. Oh, God, as Pastor had already shared, Lord, this is a time to, Father, get our eyes turned to you, Lord. This is a time for your people to, uh, to hear your voice, Lord. We, we need a voice, God. And as I told Pastor Ron this morning, I, he, he said, I want to hear you. And I said, you've been hearing, God. You're, I believe that you're speaking to your, your servants, Lord, that there are people that are hearing you, Lord. And that, Father, however we may, uh, the, the platform you may give us, whether it may be many or few, Lord, may we not sit and be idle with ourselves, but may we share what you give us, God, and help to the body of Christ to grow in that, Lord, and to see what you want him to do in our lives and in our homes and in our, in our families and in our nation, Lord. So I pray today, God, that I would not try to make this any more than what you give me, Lord, in this, Lord. And may you take it. May you season it, God. May you fill it with your spirit, Lord. And may you anoint it, God. And anoint me. Anoint these ears to hear. And prick our hearts this morning, God. And speak into our lives today, God. And draw us back today, God, to a place, Lord, of wanting to see you and knowing the importance of who you are in our lives, oh God. Father, so I pray, Lord, as I just, I feel your spirit, I, I feel emotional about this, and yet I, I feel hopeful in this, God, as you've been breathing this in my own heart, Lord, may it come out in a way that would speak to others as well. We want to give you all the praise and all the glory in Jesus' name, amen. Hallelujah. I just, uh, you know, looking here at the book of Ruth, and I started, uh, let me wipe the tears out of my eyes. It's always good to go to the Lord in prayer, amen. I need that. I know we've been doing that, but I just so, I'm so glad I go to him, and I, I just got to get off on that note and feel his presence and know that he's with me, amen. But uh, it says here, and I'm reading out of the New King James Version. That's pretty much what I'm going to be reading from this morning. And in this story, you know, and I will get, I'll get, I'll get there. But in the story, you know, it's a wonderful story of, um, you know, of God's redemption to mankind. It's, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a picture, if I could just say, of Jesus marrying the, the bride of Christ. It's, it's a picture not only of marrying us; it's a picture of God redeeming us and. Boaz is a type of Jesus, so to say, in this. It's not an allegory. He's a type. There's types and shadows. Not, he is a type. It's a prophetic thing, but he's a type of Jesus in the story. And he is uh, going to uh, give himself to Ruth, and he's going to marry her. He's going to redeem her. And it's such a great story when you see how Jesus became our redemptor. He redeemed us. He rescued us. He ransomed us. So as I was looking at this, I was like, Lord, there's so much in this. Where do you want me to go with this? What do you want to say to me? And so the Lord just said, just start reading it and just see where, I, where we go with it. He says, and now it came to pass in the days when the judges ruled that there was a famine in the land. And a certain man of Bethlehem, Judah, went to dwell in the country of Moab. And he and his wife and his two sons, the name of the man was Amimelech, I'll get it out there, Amimelech. And the name of his wife was Naomi. And the names of their two sons was Malan and Chaman, Ephraimites of Bethlehem, Judah. And they went to the country of Moab and remained there. And Amimelech, Naomi's husband died, and she was left and her two sons. Now they took wives of the women of Moab, and the name of the one was Oprah, and the name of the other Ruth. And they dwelt there about ten years. Both Malan and Chalan also died, so the women survived her two sons and her husbands. I don't know why I'm having a hard time getting the Mimilek out this morning. I'm kind of tongue-tied, but... Uh, so we have a picture here of what took place here. It said here, in the days of Judges, so this was a time of, and I'm just going to kind of build a little history here if you give me that chance, a time when in Israel when Judges ruled, there was uh, no kings, there was a, and, and when you look at the story in the book of Judges, it was a really, it was a, a bad time for the land of Israel. There was, uh, they, they, they served and worshipped a lot of gods and false gods and idols and the Moabites weren't very great uh, as far as, you know, honoring God and his commandments and so there was a lot of sin and a lot of uh, degradation that was going on at the time of Israel at the time of Ruth's day. I just want to look here at some notes here I got here. And so it said there when they left Bethlehem 
Abraham, they went to Moab, to the land of Moab. It said they left there and they were going because there was a famine in the land. There was, and so I, I wrote a few things down. I came across, I was studying. It says whenever you see famine in the land, there's at least 13 times it's mentioned. It typically speaks of judgment. That was kind of interesting when I read that. Right. Most of the time when you see famine in the land, it speaks of judgment. It speaks of God's something went awry in that nation of Israel. So there was a, a judgment that took place. And it said that um, this man and his family, they left Israel. They left the place of God's blessing. Though there was not, it wasn't going on too good at the time. And they went to the Moabites to try to live there. It says, and the famine or judgment could be because of the spiritual condition of the country. Eliminites probably shouldn't have went to Moab. It cost him his life and his son's life. Sometimes we make decisions that aren't right. Sometimes they can be costly. You reap what you sow. I, so I started looking at this story and I started thinking about our nation today. I started thinking about America today. I started thinking about the blessings of God in this country today. I'm not going to try to correlate all this, what's going on right now, but there was some similarities here to me that I started thinking about where we had at one time, and because we there's been a famine of the, the word of God, maybe not so much that, but just a spiritual drawing away from the Lord, that there's been something that's lacking in this nation. There's been something that people are trying to fill their lives up with something else besides God. And I see it all around me. And so as he left there, he, you know, it was God's blessing on him. It was God's blessing on this nation. He left there and he took his family to, the, to live in Moab. And things didn't go good there either. When he got there, all of a sudden, he died. And then his sons died. Well, they married two women there. And, uh, you know, thank God for that. That, that situation was... A good thing, really, it, it's going to turn out to be that way. But when he went there, you know, he was thinking this is going to be a good thing. And then everything kind of just blew up in his face. And we're just going to go back here to the word here just for a moment. And it says here, when they got there, it said they remained there. That in Limelech, Naomi's husband died, and she was left her two sons. Now they took wives of the woman of Moab, and the name of them was one of them was Oprah, and the name of the other was Ruth. And they dwelt there about ten years, and then Malan and Chalan also died, so the woman survived her two husbands with her two husbands. I know I read that already, but I just I want to read a few things here that um, I wrote down. And Second uh, Peter two eight says, although Lot was a man who had God's approval, he lived among the people of Sodom and Gomorrah. Each day it was like torture to him as he saw and heard the immoral things that the people did. You know, so we got a story here of when Lot went to, he was living in a place that he shouldn't have been there. And it said that all the immorality, every day it started to vex his soul. It started to grow on him. It was, it was distasteful to him. I, it was bothering him. It was, it was not good to him. It was, you know, it, you know, when you're living for God and you're trying to live for the Lord and, you know, we're all around us, there's things that are going on that, you know, the enemy uses to try to tempt us, to draw us away, to try to seduce us, to, to steal our joy, to steal our hope in Christ. I find one of the biggest things he does is just trying to take us from God's word. Trying to take us from prayer with God. Trying to take us from spending time with the Lord. And so when you do that, and then you start, start spending time in other thoughts and in other places, it starts vesting your soul. It starts making you uncomfortable. Maybe, I don't really know what it meant. I've often thought about that, and maybe no one would agree with me on this, but I've often thought that maybe Lot's soul was getting back to where it was almost becoming something that was he was being enticed with. Maybe it was something that he was starting to struggle with. Oh, no, not Lot. I don't know. Uh, you know, I mean, it says that Elijah was a man of like passions. He, he, he went through all kinds of stuff, and he prayed to God and asked God to help him. So don't think that it can't happen to you, because if you stay there long enough, it can. If you stay there long enough, it can. And I guess this is really what I'm, I'm looking at here is that, you know, this man that was, in the, in the Bible says that Elimelech's name means uh, God is my king. 
So he, he believed in God. He loved God. But for, for whatever reason, you know, he, the, the grass looked greener on the other side. Just, I know I'm kind of plowing here this morning. Just bear with me, pray with me, whatever you got to do, okay? The grass looked greener kind of on the other side to him. So he goes there and, you know, he's thinking that, you know, well, this is a better place. You know, I can raise my family here. It's, you know, it's, there's a lot of things that I don't believe in. I don't, I don't want to live this way, but I'm just going to kind of stay here and get comfortable. I'm going to tell you, you can't stay comfortable in sin. That's right. You can't stay comfortable being away from God. Right. You can't stay comfortable and try to you know, do both sides. It just doesn't work. The Holy Spirit will deal with you. Aren't you glad the Holy Spirit will deal with you? But he'll deal with you. He'll, he'll shake you. He'll tell you. He'll, he'll make you bother about that thing you're doing or thinking about doing. He'll make you do it. Thank God he makes that happen. He thank God that he he brings that into you and you know you know well you know him that know, know to do good and do it not is a sin. So I can't say whatever that thing is that you're doing and is is absolutely sin. But if the Holy Spirit is telling me not to do it or do it, then you should be listening. Amen. Amen. So you know and and I don't know what went on here. I don't know. It doesn't say. You know, it doesn't give you a whole big description in this little uh, couple paragraphs of what took place. It just says that. This man of God, he said, God was my king. This Israelite, he died. Then he had two sons that died. I'm not going to get into all that. Names were very, very significant in the Bible. Each one of their names meant something. You know, and so, you know, the, the, the name of Ruth means kindness. I looked up both the, uh, the names of the sons, of Chiron and Milan. Milan. They were both sickly names. You know, you end up in a place that you're not supposed to be. I don't know, I just, God's got me here for a minute, because I've been there. You're going to get sick. You're not going to feel good. Things aren't going to go really good for you. Things aren't going to go really positive for you. You know, you live in that lifestyle, you reap what you sow, right? I mean, you know, you look at that person, oh, he's, he, you know, alcohol has caused this and that. Yeah, it's sad, it's pitiful, but you know, because he lived there so long, it's he's, he's got the reaping what he sold into his life. He can hardly get out of bed. He's got alcohol. He's got a bad headaches. He's, you know, he, he can't think straight. He, you know, he's got to get up and drink again in the, in the morning because he, he's got to feel good about what he did the night before and he can't hardly walk straight. That's not what God wants you to have. Now, God doesn't want you to live that way. God doesn't want you to feel all drugged up and all whatever. God wants to give you life. God wants to give you hope. God wants to give you peace. That's what knowing Jesus Christ is all about. That's what I love about this story. And I'm just kind of painting a little black here if I could. And it is black because I believe America is one away from God. I believe we've we've kind of lost our, our, our way with the Lord. And, you know, I'm not pointing any fingers. I do it myself a lot of times. I, I, I got to, you know, make sure I stay right with God. I got to pray and ask God to help me every day. Amen. I can't, as best friends, I can't judge you. But when you look and you see the fruit that we're bearing... When you see the things that are going on, it also makes you wonder what's going on, what's taking place. And you know, when I was looking at the story, and I'm gonna, I'm, I'm kind of going here now. So as I'm looking at the story, I said, you know, you know, and I'm gonna get a couple different things here. So just bear with me. But I'm looking at it, and I'm like, thank you, God, for a wise woman. And I started thinking about Naomi. And I started thinking, and I was just thinking this. I'm not saying it should be, but I, as I was reading this book, and as I was reading it, I thought this book should have probably been named Ruth and Naomi. Because when I looked at Naomi, she was just definitely, you know, a great woman of God. She didn't see that. She didn't know that. I'm going to get ahead of myself here. It says here, and I'm going to just go ahead and go back to the word here. And then our, her husband died, her sons died. It says, Then Naomi arose with her daughter-in-law that she might return from the country of Moab. For she had heard in the country of Moab that the Lord had visited his people by giving them bread. Oh my gosh, so she, she, she hears that back in Israel, back with Jesus, that God is blessing 
She hears that the land that she left with her husband now that there's bread back in the land. And it's kind of interesting to me when you look at the story because it's so, like I said, and I'm not one to get into all that and say that, but I was looking at it. I seen all these things just dropping from the pages. And I'm like, wow, wow. You know, I know you've done that before. It's like, wow, I see Jesus here. Wow, I see Jesus there. I see Jesus is in all over these pages. He's all over, all over the book, all over the Bible. Amen. But as I was looking at this, it said, Ruth said, Naomi said, I hear there's bread back at home. I hear there's, you know, there's, there's food, there's substance back at home. And I was amazed because when I was looking at this, thinking about the correlation of Jesus and the propheticness of it all, then she said, she heard in, in her country of Moab that the Lord had visited his people by giving them bread. Therefore, she went out from the place where she was with her daughters-in-laws with her, and they went the way to return to the land of Judah. And Naomi said to her daughters-in-law, Go return each to her mother's house. The Lord dealt kindly with you as you have dealt with the dead and with me. The Lord grant that you may find rest each in the house of her husband. I just want to look. I got a few notes here. Just bear with me for a minute. I wrote, Naomi returns with Ruth. We may be under judgment, but there is still time to turn back to God. <laughs> Thank God, Naomi said, I got to get back home. Amen. I got to get back to Jesus. I got to, you know, the Bible says that Jesus is the living bread. Jesus said, I am the living bread that came down from heaven. If you eat of this bread, you'll never hunger and thirst again. Amen. Amen. Now, I mean, this is a spiritual type of Jesus, if you can see this. But as she said to them, you know what? There's bread in the house. We're, star we're starving here. We're, 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 we're anemic here. I, I've lost my husband. I've lost my sons. I've lost everything. I, I, I've got to get back to something that gives me substance in my life. I, I, you know, when I was away from God and backslid, and I've shared this testimony, I'm going to get into all that. But I got to a place where I thought I had something or I had a lot. And in the end result, the Holy Spirit showed me I had nothing. I was empty. Oh, I mean, honestly, I'm so glad that God brought me to nothing. That sometimes God will break you to heal you. That sometimes God will get you to a place of you looking at your life and saying, I'm so sick of this. And that's just where you got to get. Because when you get so sick of it, that's where God can start speaking into your life and healing you and redeeming you. And so as Naomi, she said, I mean, can you imagine? She lost her husband. She lost her only two sons. She's with these girls that really aren't no relation to her. I mean, they're just daughters of all. They are, don't get me wrong. They were more than she realized. But she, she just thought, you know, don't you, you guys just stay here in your hometown and whatever. But I, I got to get back. So they both wanted to go with her. So she wasn't going to stop them. I'm so glad she didn't stop them, aren't you? I'm so glad. It's good to bring people along with us, amen. When you're going to the house of bread, when you're going to Jesus, when you know you've been eating from the table, aren't, don't you want to bring someone with you? I'm so glad when Pastor Miles says, I gotta talk to my neighbor. I gotta have, I gotta talk to this person. I gotta I gotta talk to my son out in the parking lot. I gotta talk to my daughter about God. I'm I'm eating, but I, I don't want this all for myself. I, I gotta share this with somebody. Amen. You just can't get Jesus and hang out to him by yourself. If you're really eating from the table, it's gonna come out of you like a sponge. He's going to just saturate from you and it's going to pour into other people. That's how you always know when people have been spending time with God, when they've been in the Word or when they've been praying or just trying to stay close to Jesus. doesn't mean that you got to be some great Bible student or some great prayer. Just kind of walking with the Lord and talking with the Lord. The Holy Spirit will get a hold of you and He'll, he'll speak into your life and people around you. You don't got to put bumper stickers on your car. You don't got to do what? Jesus will be shown and seen in you. Amen. You know, I've been spending a lot of time lately just, you know, I had these stickers on my window. We've got them on all of our vehicles, three of them. And we originally got the stickers to go out to the park, the Metro Parks with Nicole. We, she loves going out to the parks. We, we get her in the van. We got her in the handicapped van. We get her in there and we drive around the parks and we pull down the window. Even in the cold weather, I'll put it down a little bit. We look for the deer and I'll call them mama deer and baby deer. And, oh, she'll get, she'll get focused out at that park and look and she'll see a deer and she'll get off. You know, that, there's nothing that blesses me more than just seeing her smile. Just, 
see her light up at that. You know, so hey, we, we use those stickers to go on there. And once in a while, I'll go out there and I just drive around. And I felt, you know, I'm like, man, I just wish this weather would get a little bit nicer so I could maybe start walking out here. And I remember the Lord saying, you ain't going to freeze. <laughs> you ain't going to freeze. You've done it before. Just put you on some clothes. Get your ear moss on. Get, you know, so I just, you know, not, I, I want to implore you. Get out away from everything. Go go for a ride in the park. Go for a drive. Get away. Get away with God. So I've been just God's giving me an opportunity where I can spend a little time just walking the trails in Willow Park. And oh, it's been great. Every day I tell my wife, I went a little further today, according to my watch. I went a little further. It's, and it's been great. There's little ponds and there's little creeks and there's little picnic tables. I can sit down and you know, not I, I don't know if I'd walk on a day like today, but yesterday was a great day to walk out in the park. And you know, I'll listen to some messages or I'll listen to some worship. Or sometimes I'll just go out there and just talk to God. But God wants to talk to us. God wants, I'm so glad that Naomi was listening. I'm so glad that she heard there was bread in the house. <laughs> I'm so glad she said, I heard there's bread back home. I, I'm not going to stay here. I'm not going to let this destroy me any longer. I want to tell you that right now. You know what? It's time to get back to Jesus. It's time to America to get back to. It's time for you and your families to get back to Jesus. You can stay in Moab. It's this type and shadow of maybe the, a worldly lifestyle. You can stay in there. And all it's going to do, the Bible says, the wages of sin is death. The Bible says that the devil comes but to seek, kill, and destroy. That's all the devil wants to do, and that's all he's trying to do right now. He's trying to just get us off, thinking that the end is over, and oh no, what are we going to do? And things look so bad, and oh, what, woe is me. Oh, I'm so glad that God is in charge, and God's got a plan, and God had a plan throughout this book as well. I started reading that, and I was like, oh God, thank you that Naomi went back. And I'm not going to get into the whole story how Ruth clinged to her, you know, Oprah talked about going and then she decided to go back, but Ruth clinged to her and said, your home is my home, you know, your land is my land, where you die, I'll die, your God is my God, Ruth, man, she said, I, I, I'm with you, I'm with you, are you with me, are you, are you with me, you tell the Lord I'm with you, Lord, wherever you are, wherever it goes on, wherever you take me. And I started thinking about Naomi and, 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 and Ruth, and so, you know, as I was going through this and I, I already shared all that, but, you know, honestly, I, I feel like, I don't want to be, just be this because I feel like God showed, spoke something else to me in this story, but as I was thinking about, you know, them returning back to this land, it was a, 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 a it wasn't something that really Naomi or Ruth knew what was going to take place. It isn't like they had the book of Ruth and it was all written out. They, they didn't, you know, we got the whole story so we could just sit there and say, ooh, that's cool. But they didn't know what was going to take place. There was a lot of doubt, a lot of speculation. There was a, you know, I, I imagine a lot really for both of them. They probably weren't saying it, but I think, uh, you know, Naomi, Naomi was saying, I wonder what my people are going to think about me bringing them all by this to their home. And I, want, I imagine Ruth was saying, I wonder what they're going to think about me coming to this place that really, uh, I, I, you know, I'm, I'm a Gentile, I'm a Moabite, I, I really, I, I, I'm not supposed to be accepted by the law into this place. Oh, there's so much grace here. There's so much, don't tell me God's not in grace in the Old Testament. There's so much grace in the book of Ruth. And so I don't know what was going on, but I think there was something happening there that was kind of maybe going through their minds, I would think. And so she said here uh, in verse, uh, I'm not, you know, I'm not going to get into all that because I want to, I want, I want to get going here. So, so after Ruth, you know, implores her, please don't let me go. In verse 18, when she saw that she, she was determined to go with her, she stopped speaking to her. Oh, I'm so glad. Oh, just, you just got to get determined sometime. I, I'm determined to get out of more. I'm determined to stay out of this situation I'm in. you got to get determined to say, I'm going to keep following Jesus. This, this is wherever he takes me, I don't know. I'm not there yet. She didn't have all the blueprint, but she knew she was going to somewhere better than where she was. There was destiny inside of her. There, there was something inside of her that she didn't know. And when she saw she was determined, now the two of them went until they came to Bethlehem. And it happened when they came to Bethlehem, they were all excited because of them. And the woman said, is this Naomi? Now, they've been gone a long time. So Naomi must have been a very uh, prominent woman in that city there, in Bethlehem. 
And this is what everybody in Bethlehem. This is Bethlehem where Jesus was born. This is the same city. And so she goes back there and the people are excited to see her. But she said to them, do not call me Naomi. Call me Mara. See, Naomi means pleasant. Her name meant pleasant. It was she was uh, she was well liked. She was she was she was always smiling. She was she was a very happy woman. Don't call me that no longer, she said. My name is Mara, for the Lord hath dealt bitterly with me. I went out full, and the Lord has brought me home again empty. Why do you call me Naomi? Since the Lord has testified against me, the Lord Almighty has afflicted me. Man. So Naomi returned with Ruth the Moabitess, her daughters-in-law with her, and returned from the country of Moab. Now they came to Bethlehem in the beginning of barley harvest. I just, you know, I, I, I just want to say, I know I'm rolling along here. I don't know if I've lost you. I don't know if you're here with me. I pray so. But I, there were some things here that I started to see as Naomi was going back. You know, I remember as I was in the bathroom that night and the Holy Spirit was knocking on my heart and the devil was telling me, just take that razor out of your cupboard and just slice, slice your wrist. I never thought about suicide. But it was happening. Why? Because the, the devil wanted me. He didn't want me to go back to God. I had been backslidden for a long time. I've been a Moabite. I've been living in the country of Moabite. I've been living in a, in, a, in a state of being away from God and the Holy Spirit was knocking on my heart and the devil was wrestling with me about not giving my life back to God and you know he, he was saying all kinds of stuff to me and as I was listening to him you know for a few minutes but then the Holy Spirit broke through and got a hold of my heart oh I, I won't share that maybe I don't know if God gave me time to go there but it's the Holy Spirit got a hold of my heart I'm so glad I heard his voice amen I didn't give in to the enemy. I'm telling you, the enemy will tell all kinds of things to you. The Bible says he's a father of lies. He'll say all kinds of things to you to try to discourage you and, and, and to make you feel that it's, it's not worth living for God. I'm telling you, living for Jesus is the greatest life there is. There's no greater thing in the world than knowing Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Not just knowing him, but living and walking with him. In him we live, in him we move, and in him we have our being. Amen? It's not just some hype thing, but she was like not happy. She said, don't don't even go there. I've lost my husband. I've lost my two sons. I, I left here full. I've come back empty. Oh. <laughs> and as I was I have mean, never said this before, but God does this with me. I woke up. I told my wife, I woke up in the middle of the night. Now, maybe this is the title for my message. I don't know. And as I woke up in the middle of the night, I heard the Lord say to me, Ruth was a diamond in the rough. And then I heard the Lord say to me, and Nicole is a diamond in the rough. And I, was, I started to think about that, and I wrote some things down here. Diamonds in the rough. I woke up hearing this the other night. Not sure if I was dreaming or what, but I know I was hearing it very loud and clear. The Holy Spirit said to me, Nicole was a diamond in the rough, just like Ruth. S something that is in poor condition, but is that likely to become valuable with appropriate care and attention. That's what the Webster says. Rough diamonds, I'm sorry. Give me a minute. I'm sorry. I, I get a little teary eyed here. Rough diamonds usually resemble lumps of pale colored glass. They often have an oily appearance and don't sparkle. Very few rough diamonds are actually gem quality. Only those with very palest colors or the colorless, colorless will pass the test. What is the origin or the phrase, a diamond in the rough? Have you ever heard of that? They're a diamond in the rough. Right? You know, I've heard it said so many times, but I never really knew what it meant. This phrase is a metaphor clearly referring to the original unpolished state of the diamond gemstones, especially those that have the potential to become highly quality jewels. It is most commonly expressed in the form of rough diamond. Naomi could not see her diamond in the rough. All she could see was heartache and pain and loss. Little did she know that she had a diamond of great value and hope in the promise of Ruth. Naomi 
was so broken, so hurt, I don't know if I'm speaking to anybody, so filled with loss, so filled with pain, so filled with, not. I can't take one more night of this, one more day of this, she could not see that what she had with her was the promise of the Messiah. She could not see that through Ruth, through the lineage of Ruth, that Jesus was going to be born. <laughs> That's a crazy, isn't it? She's like, well, if you want to come with me, come on. Little did she know that this diamond in the rough, this she was pretty, but she did not see her potential. Or she would have said, you're coming with me, baby, because I'm going to get you hooked up with my kid, and I'm, I'm going to get you hooked up with my, my brother-in-law or whoever he was to her. And, you know, when things are all going to turn around, she just said, okay, you can come. Sometimes diamonds in the rough just end up in our lives and we don't even know why. Right. Sometimes diamonds in the rough come in our lives and we don't see it being a diamond in the rough. We say, I don't deserve this. I, I didn't earn this. My husband led me here. Now look what happened to me. This situation happened. I didn't want to get this disease. I didn't want to get this cancer. And now look at what happened to me. I've been trying to do my best to serve God and read my Bible and pray and read every day. And now look at what happened to me. I left here full and I was feeling so good in my life. And now look at what's happened to me. Oh, I want to tell you that there is a diamond in the rough, amen? That in your situation, God can turn that around. In that child that you think that no one else can get a hold of, that's a diamond in the rough. I, I, and I, I was looking the other day, and please don't take this wrong. I've got two beautiful grandsons, and Josiah and Jacob. And, you know, Josiah, you've heard me talk a lot about Josiah. And they're both beautiful, wonderful gifts that God has given us. And, you know, I, I, we talk a lot about, you know, I'll tell share past stories and past around mostly because I see him probably the most out of all of you about how Josiah is just, you know, he's, he's always wanting to fix things and wanting to help me with things. And, you know, he's just one of these He's three years old. He thinks he's 18. You know, he can do anything. He wants to feed Nicole. He wants to help Nicole. He's, you know, he's, he's just, uh, you know, wants to work on my car. He wants to help me take the trash out. I'm like, you are, he's only like this big. I'm like, you are an amazing little man, you know. And no problem, Papa. I got it. He needs some help. He's always wanting to be very helpful and he's very smart. And I'm like, man, you know, I just, you know, I, I see so much in him. And then there's Jacob. He's, you know, a year and a half. Beautiful, beautiful, but he's quiet. He's not like his brother. He's he's quiet, but you know, as the older he gets, you know, he does his little jibber jabbers talk. You know, and I say the one time I think he's speaking in tongues. And then we, we were joking the other night about taking my phone and trying to see if I can interpret what he was saying. <laughs> he goes out and she said, "Well, maybe we can get the language and find out what he's saying." I said, "Maybe." But you know, you, you know, he'll, he'll be looking at the TV or doing that. But every once in a while, I'll get him, and he'll just he'll look right at me, and he'll give me the biggest smile, or he'll let me hold him. And as I was looking at him and talking to him the other day, and I was talking to him, and I said, you know what? You're a diamond in the rough. You're a diamond in the rough. I, I see you in there, Jacob. I, I see inside. I see God all over you. I, I think sometimes we need to speak into things that we see, that we say, oh, they're no good. They're not no good. I think we need to speak into their lives and say, oh, no, I see God in you. I see God changing you. I, I see I, God calls those things that are not as though they were, amen. I, I, I think sometimes we have not because we ask not. I, I think that sometimes we got to start speaking into our lives and into our homes and into our families about things that God has got for us that we thought is no good to anyone else, is no use to us. Oh, don't throw away the treasure. <laughs> don't get rid of what God has given you. It might not be a good thing. It might be hard. It, it might be a struggle for a long time. Time. You might have battled for years praying that they would come back. But I'm going to tell you, there's some diamonds in the rough out here today. There's some diamonds in the rough that God is polishing up, that God is going to turn around, that God is going to bring great glory and honor to Him. Amen. And as I looked about and I thought about it now, and God reminded me of all the things that he's done with Nicole and through Nicole and all the miracles and all the blessings. And, you know, and I've seen him do things. And I, I started praying about Penerton. That, that place is a diamond in the rough, God. That place is a diamond in the rough. And, you know, God was 
letting me know that there's people out here that he cares about, that he loves, and that he's he's watching over, and that he's and I believe that God is drawing people back today and calling us back to a place to come to who what he really wants us to be, amen. Maybe we just need to give some people an opportunity to be what God's called them to be, amen. Quit putting their, their your clothes on them, quit trying to make like uh Saul did with um David and put his armor on him. Maybe just let them be who God wants them to be. Amen. As my wife says, he'll come around. He'll come to his own. He's coming around. Amen. You just got to be that. You just got to be that guy. You just got to be that one that sets that example. You just got to be that one that nurtures them and talks into their lives. Amen. Amen. And I was thinking about how, you know, I don't know. She didn't see it. She didn't see it. I know she didn't see it because she said right here, don't call me that. Call me miserable. Call me, I've said that, I'm miserable. I've said it just last night, I'm miserable. Call me miserable. I heard one of the spirits say, don't you say that. You've been tried like precious gold in the fire. You've been, you're a, you're a diamond in the rough. Don't you be saying that about yourself. Good looking so down on everything and thinking negative. Don't you see what I'm going to do in your life? Do you see what I've already been doing? I know I'm speaking to someone today. You think you've went too far. You think you've been a hazard. You think you've blown it too much. You think there's no use here. God can do anything. With God, anything is possible. God's got great plans for us. Even, even in this nation today, I believe, in the, in the midst of the famine, in the midst of judgment, in the midst of uh, all the tribulation, I believe God is calling us back, maybe not so much to a building, but to a place of just eating from Him and coming back to a place of, of dining with Jesus at His table and eating from Him and, and drinking from His cup and hearing His voice and, and being a light to those around us. Because I'm telling you, this is a time we need to be drawn closer to God than ever before. Ever before. And although, and although you know, in, in, in the story, it turns here, and although, you know, and I wrote this down, and although, and I got some other, I wrote some other people, now I'm not going to go into this, you know, I, I, David was a diamond in the rough, Joseph was a diamond in the rough, Moses was a diamond in the rough, amen. All these people, Peter was a diamond in the rough. The disciples were diamonds in the rough. Uh, when you look, you, you get what I'm saying? The, the, the metaphor is they, they don't look good. They, they don't look like there's anything in them. But oh, God has a way of polishing us up. Sometimes the polishing up can be a little rough sometimes. Get the roughness off. But he knows how to do it, amen? Because he, he wants us to shine. And as I was looking at the story, I started to think, although, for some reason, although Ruth, Naomi didn't see the diamond in the rough, I believe that Naomi seen, I mean, Ruth seen the diamond in the rough with Naomi. I believe she seen it. I, whatever, and she didn't know when she went back to what was going to take place. She didn't know when she went back to her homeland that, you know, the, the slam with her uh, her mother in law that her you know that she was gonna uh, end up you know marrying Boaz and Boaz was gonna redeem her when you look at the story of uh, what happened in that story and how Boaz Boaz bought the field which is uh, a type of shadow of how he bought Ruth and how he you know, Jesus bought us and yet all through all of that Naomi never lost I mean Ruth never lost sight of what Naomi was to her. She was a, a, a godly woman, and she she's seen that, you know, I just want to just turn here just for a moment. I'm going to wrap it up with this. In chapter 4, if you want to go with me, you can. Now, Boaz went up to the gate and sat down there, and behold, no, I'm not going to read all that. That's too much. So Boaz, in verse 13, took Ruth, and she became his wife. And when he went into her, the Lord gave her conception, and she bore a son. Then the woman said to Naomi, Blessed be the Lord who has given. Do you get this? Verse 14. Then the woman said to Naomi, Blessed be the Lord who has not left you this day without a close relative. <laughs> and by his name be famous in Israel. And may you and may he be to you a restorer of life and a nurturer of old age. And for your daughter-in-law who loves you, who is better to you than seven sons, has borne him. Then Naomi took the child and laid him in her, on her bosom, and she became a nurse to him. 
Hallelujah. Isn't it amazing? Oh, you know, wait a minute. These women are telling Naomi, listen, what you thought, God replaced seven times more. God has blessed you. God has given you a grandchild. God is, you know, so she's she's raising this little boy. Says, then Naomi took the child and laid him in her bosom and became nurse to him. Also, the neighbor women gave him a name saying, there is a name to Naomi, and they called his name Obed, which is the father of Jesse, which is the father of David. Isn't that amazing? How here, this Moabitess that shouldn't have been accepted into the land of Israel, really she becomes a great, 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 great grandmother of Jesus, amen, by lineage. Isn't it amazing that even though you mess up in your life, things can go wrong, and all the things that you look at, you know, it's amazing how God can take a bad situation and turn it around for good. It's amazing how God can take a situation that you thought was impossible or maybe you want to do a lifestyle you know and I was thinking about you know even when I was bachelor and the things that I did there and then a lot of people that you know I came back to the Lord and then the Lord it was that's been many years ago over 30 something years ago and how you know that lifestyle that I lived and you know the people that I was around and how I, I thought about it the other night about all the people that I was growing up with and around that you know when I was away from God and living and kind of like a heathen, how God has allowed me to speak to them, to do funerals for them, to speak into their lives, and to see some of their sons and daughters saved. And you know, it's amazing what God can do and turn things around, amen. Even in the midst of you messing up and doing something you shouldn't have done, or maybe bringing a mole right into your life, God has a way of turning that around. Oh, I was so looking at this, and it goes on to say here, it says, and Naomi took the child, laid him in her bosom, and became a nurse to him. Also, the neighbor women gave him a name, saying, there is a name born to Naomi, and they called his name Obed, which means worshiper. Oh, you know what? I just want to look here. In verse 11, then all the people who were at the gate, I'm sorry, I, gotta have, I just want to read this. Then all the people that were at the gate, the elders said, we are witnesses. The Lord make this woman, woman who is coming to your house like Rachel and Leah who built the house of Israel. May you prosper in Ephraim and be famous in Bethlehem. And may your house be like the house of Piers and Tamar, who bore to Judah, because the offspring which the Lord will give you from this young woman. And so these women are at the gate when they find out, you know, that she got married to Boaz, and they're saying, hey, listen, you know, may you be blessed. And, you know, and I, I read this, maybe I heard this somewhere before, it said, and may you be famous in Bethlehem. Well, would you say Bethlehem's not famous? Amen. <laughs> may you be famous in Bethlehem. May, it's amazing to me when you look at the story and you see that Jesus was born in Bethlehem and that was a prophetic promise and not only was it a promise but he was from the lineage of Ruth and Boaz. It's amazing to me when you see how Jesus brings all these things together that you thought were crazy, that you thought couldn't happen, that is not Bethlehem famous? Do we not celebrate in this little village of you know, that Christmas and everything else in this little city of Bethlehem a son shall be born, king of kings and lord of lords from her lineage, from all this bad things that happened and I look in America today and I'm going to close with this. I am I thank God in the midst of everything that's going on I know that you're raising up sons and daughters Amen. you're raising up people for this such a time as this Amen. in the midst of this world that's falling apart that there are some diamonds in the rough that there are some things out there that we thought couldn't be that I believe God is going to start rising up in the last days He's going to start using us for his glory. I, 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 I want to say this. and I, I, This is one of the key things I want to end with is that you need to get hungry for Jesus. You need to get hungry for Jesus. And I want to say one thing right now. Famine has a way of making you hungry. And I think judgment has a way of turning us back to God. And I think God is using this maybe to start getting us back to God. Amen. And I don't want it to happen. But if it's happening... I want to be wise like Naomi. I want to say, get me back to Jesus. Amen? Get me back to the place where I can feel his presence and peace in my life. Because in this day and age we're living in right now, he's the only one we can hold on to. He's the only one we can trust. He's the only one that we can lay anchor in today. So I pray this week. Come on up, Pastor Ron and Linda. I pray this week that it's the Holy Spirit. I don't know. I kind of jumped around here a little bit. I want to stay on focus here. 
But I, I feel in my heart so much that there are people that are looking around them and saying, how did I end up in this lifestyle? How did this happen? How did this go so bad? And God is calling us to a place saying, you know what? Let me take care of that. That's why I died for you. That's why I redeemed you. That's why I'm here today to help you. And I'm so glad that God helps us in the midst of our struggles, in the midst of our pain, in the midst of our disappointments, in the midst of things that doesn't make any sense to us. I'm so glad that God has a purpose for our lives and our homes. You know, I, I know I have battles. I know I have struggles even this week again. But I need to hear God's voice more and more every day. You do too. You need to hear, you need to turn off the TV, turn off. I'm not saying, you know, turn it off completely, but get in tune with God. Hear what God is saying. Get into your Bible. Get some time praying with the Lord. Let him speak to you. Let him tell you about things. Maybe there's a child in your life. I feel very strong about this. Maybe you've got some people in your life that you think there's no hope for them. Listen, God sees them, diamonds in the rough. He went to a great lengths to redeem us back to him. I love you today, and he loves you very much. God bless you. Hallelujah. You know, I was thinking while he was, it was that one section that he was reading that kind of jumped out at me. And uh, I'm not trying to add anything to what he's already said. Uh, but uh, it said they took their journey and they came all the way to Bethlehem. Now that may not mean much to most folks, but it just kind of jumped out at me for the simple fact that they could have stopped anywhere else. Yeah. Israel was a big place, you know, as yes. far as, but, it, but they went all the way to Bethlehem. Yes. And what I think we fail to realize is the word Bethlehem means house of bread. Yes. And I thought, yeah, Lord, that's what we need. We need to get back to our Bethlehem. Amen. The house of bread. Amen. The place where we eat from your table Amen. on a regular basis. Amen. Because you're never going to get any stronger spiritually if you don't eat at God's table. Amen. And then I thought about those diamonds in the rough. I don't know if any of you have ever seen one. They're just big old looking nasty rocks. But you put that piece of nasty rock in the hands of the right jeweler. And he begins to take his chisel and he begins to cut away all the stuff that's not supposed to be there. And all of a sudden, it comes out and you've got this beautiful, looks like a piece of glass, but it's so strong that it can actually cut through steel. Yes. And, you know, sometimes God needs to mold us into a way that we can be like that diamond that can cut through steel. Because there's a lot of opposition that you're going to face. There's a lot of things you're going to have to go through. But if you'll stand for Jesus Christ... Spend a lot of time in the house of bread and let him mold you and make you into that diamond that is no longer a diamond in the rough, but you're a diamond sure enough. Let the Lord Jesus work on you in ways that only he can. Amen. This course came to my mind and uh, Sister Linda said, do we know it? And I said, I don't know. Maybe. Come. Give me an F. Come. Holy Spirit. I
been speaking to you about something, and uh, I'm going to try my best to do it. I know the enemy will always attack you and try to stop you from anything that you feel like the Holy Spirit would have you do. But I'm going to start Tuesday night prayer here. Um, if you want to come and pray, uh, I'll have the church open. Just come in, find your spot. I'll probably have some type of music playing or whatever. But, uh, you know, probably between, you know, six and eight, something like that. I want to just have, two, we used to have Tuesday night prayer here. And it was such a, a time of refreshing with God. And you might say, well, I can't pray for two hours. So I'm not asking you to. Just ask you to maybe take time out on that evening and just come in. We have Wednesday night um, worship. Caleb and I come here and we do something and I share a little bit on Wednesday night. But I won't be sharing anything on Tuesday. It won't be, you know, only thing we'll just come in here and have some time of prayer. And you can come in between any of that time. You don't have to come at a certain time. Uh, the door will be open. The lights will, you know, be on a little bit. And we'll spend some time in prayer. I just feel it's necessary in this day and time in which we live that people get back to praying and to seeking God in behalf of this nation of ours. There's going to come a time, and I think it's not too far off, uh, when you're going to have to understand that you may not be able to come to church. There's going to come a time, and you even heard some men prophetically speaking this week, that there are going to be some churches that stand for what the Word of God says, that somebody's going to come put chains on their door so they can't get in. And uh, you say, oh, brother, that can't happen. Listen, it's already happening. We've not been removed from social media. Anybody that's some type of conservative, their voices are being silenced. And only those that are radical and those that are crazy, I think, are the ones that are being heard. When you can take off people that stand for God and principles and stuff and throw them aside and still let terrorists and all kinds of people still project their views with their I hate America things and you can still let them do their thing on social media. Something is going in the wrong direction. So, you know, if you could come on Tuesday night, I'd be happy to have you. But I learned a long time ago, I'm not going to depend on anybody coming. I'm not. I used to come and stand by the door and see if anybody was coming to pray with me. And I'm not going to do that. That's just going to be one of those things. I'm going to come. I'm going to pray. I may be done praying by the time you get here. I or I may be in the middle of a season of prayer when you come in. But uh, uh, And you can stay as long as you want. And then when you get done, just excuse yourself. You don't even have to excuse yourself. Just get up and go out. Uh, but I want to start a time of prayer on Tuesday night. So uh, if you can come, I invite you to do so. You that may be watching us by Facebook. Our church will be open. Or... You can just maybe take that time on Tuesday night, go in your basement, go in your bathroom, go out in your garage, whatever you, whatever place you want to go to, and just go and spend some time in prayer between 6 and 8 in the evening. And uh, and it don't even have to be between 6 and 8. If you want to do it at 6 in the morning, if you want to do it at 12 in the afternoon, I don't care. I just understand that there's time that we need to start praying and seeking God. Does anybody here agree with me? Do you think that it's a time we need to pray more than we ever have before? It's just one of those things that... Uh, that I feel like God's burdening, burdening us to do. So uh, spend some time with the Lord. And don't just do it on Tuesday. Do it every day. Somehow, some way, do it every day. Uh, put your Bible on your dining room table so you can't uh, just walk by and act like it's not there. You know, just put it out there and say, oh, i got to go by and maybe read a verse or two or three or a whole chapter or whatever you do in your time of worship and praise to God by yourself. Don't expect to get everything here. You won't. There's things that come from heaven to your own personal life if you'll call on God. Sandy, we're praying for you today. I know you're not feeling well in the name of Jesus. Be well in Jesus' name. Sister Lois, I know also you haven't been feeling well. You be well in Jesus' name. That's my prayer for you. Uh, you know, somebody asked my ministry father one time they come up and said, Brother, would you pray that I would be healed? And he looked right at him and said, Well, ma'am, do you want to be healed or do you want to be well? And she goes, Well, I want to be well. He goes, Then be well in Jesus' name. And I've adopted it for myself. 
I don't just say be healed, I say be well. Not just healed physically, but be well from head to toe, spiritually, physically, financially, whatever. Be well in Jesus' name. Amen. Praise the Lord. I love you today. I, I praise God for the opportunity to come into your home. I praise God for being able to speak to those that are here in our sanctuary today. We're just trusting the Lord to uh, breathe on us more and more each day so that we might hear his voice and do what he tells us to do. And I don't want to shock any of you, but it's snowing outside. <laughs> Aren't you glad? Praise the Lord. Sister Loretta back there, she told me before service started, she goes, we're supposed to get two or three inches by Tuesday. Well, we may get it today, but that's okay. God's in charge, amen? Thank you for all that you do for us and helping us financially. Thank you for all that you do helping us prayerfully because we do need your help in all of those areas because without you, we can't be here. I love you. God bless you. Have a great day. Amen. Bless you.